Here is the third part of this lecture. Here we shall discuss about global heating and its consequences. We shall now take up the first topic of this part, global heating and its consequences. In this part, we shall cover three topics, melting of polar ice caps and rise in the sea levels, storms and flooding, destruction of the coastal forest and marshlands. Here is displayed a map of average global temperatures from 2010 to 2019 compared to the temperature profile recorded 50 years ago, that is, in 1951 to 1978. A rise of 1 to 2 degrees Celsius in the temperature is more apparent in the northern hemisphere compared to the southern hemisphere, indicating it is proportional to the huger population which is present in the northern hemisphere. As a consequence of anthropogenic activities, the pollution levels is higher in the northern hemisphere. One of the dangerous consequences the Earth is facing is the wreckage of polar ice caps and its melting. The ice caps on the oceans reflect 50 to 70 percent of the solar radiations incident on its surface. On the other hand, the ocean surface is dark and capable of reflecting just 6% of the solar incidence. This phenomenon has serious implications. In the first place, the melting of ice increases the sea level, which creates a potential threat to the coastal regions which undergo submerging. Secondly, the failure of reflection of the solar radiation will aggravate heating of the oceans, which will ultimately heat up more of the ice caps to melt. The process will no longer remain linear and might proceed at an exponential rate. A prominent example in this regard is melting of ice in Antarctica. The Ross Ice Shelf is the Antarctica's largest ice shelf is melting 10 times faster. The Ross Ice Shelf, shown in the map in red color, is the world's largest ice shelf. It is of size of country France. In the recent studies, it has been found that a part of this ice shelf have been eroded by the warm ocean waters, and cave-like multiple cavities have formed at the base of the shelf. This directly implies that it might create a wreckage and floating away of ice pieces, reducing the size of the ice shelf and rise in the sea levels. Additionally, this huge ice shelf of thickness 750 meters or 2450 feet protect the glaciers. The glaciers continuously move over the surface to feed the ice to the shelf and it stabilizes the same. Wreckage of this shelf would lead the glaciers to flow to the ocean, causing loss of trapped ice at an exponential rate. The process can be understood here. This schematic displays the glacier flow under gravity towards the front surface of the ice shelf. The bion or the hydrostatic forces at the ice shelf front partially suppose the ice shelf mass and provides a kind of break to the moving glacier until it proceeds to a certain length and then stops. In turn, the moving glacier protects and repairs the surface of the ice shell. The two main effects arising from the rise in the temperatures are accelerated percolation of warm ocean waters through the base of the ice shell forming cavities, which later on grow bigger to take the shape of caves. In the next step, there is formation of fractured zones and water rushes into it, part it wide open and the shelf wrecks. When the shelf wrecks, 
the shelf now becomes unstable and tends to collapse under its own weight. As the shelf retreats past grounding line, the buoyant support decreases at the front and continuously moving glaciers no longer find strong anchorage or breaking forces to stop. This in turn cannot repair the ice shelf and the glaciers in the front calves rapidly into pieces of ice blocks which soon become detached from the shelf to float away. The glacier or ice cast is a specific term for breaking of an ice mass to separate or break so that a part becomes detached. This causes the loss of ice to occur even at a greater speed and the glacier surface finds a new surface which is lower than the previous one. As we see in the picture, the old surface is quite thicker and the new surface is thinning of the glacier mass. And slowly and slowly the glaciers move forward to drop in the ocean and the loss of mass of the ice occurs at a far greater rate. Needless to say that the wreckage of ice cells floating and melting away of the icebergs and flowing away of the glaciers into warm ocean waters are the main causes of sea levels to rise. This is creating a potential threat to the major coastal areas to submerge. The sea level rise in the coastal areas across the Pacific Ocean is shown in the map. The Pacific Island nations are the worst hit receiving ends of this phenomena. We shall see more of this little later in this part of the lecture. Here in this picture, we can see the consequences of sea level rise. The sea level sets a baseline for the storm surges. The potentially destructive rise in the sea height occurs during a coastal storm. As local sea level rises, so does the baseline, allowing the coastal storm to surge and penetrate farther inland. With higher global sea levels predicted in 2050 and 2100, areas much farther inland would be at risk of being flooded. The extent of local flooding also depends on factors like tides, natural and artificial barriers, and contours of the coastal lands. Here is a collection of satellites in the space, constantly measuring the sea surface movements at the coastal lines. It is started with the Topix Poseidon and then continued with Jason 1 and followed by the Ocean Surface Topography Mission or JSON-2 and by JSON-3. The next serious consequence of global warming and heating is the change in the pattern, number, intensity and frequency of tropical cyclones and avalanches. In the year 2018, U.S. National Climate Change Assessment reported that Increase in the greenhouse gases and air pollution have contributed to the increase in the Atlantic hurricane activity since 1970. Here in this picture, a satellite image showing Hurricane Katia in the left making landfall over the Mexican state of Veracruz. Another hurricane Irma in the center is approaching towards Cuba. And the third hurricane, Joe's, is reaching peak intensity on the September 8, 2017. And another report suggests that there has been observed a substantial uptake in the frequency of the most intense cyclones in the tropical region and increase in the rainfall rates by 20% within 100 kilometers of the storm center. A tropical cyclone is primarily controlled by its actual environmental sea surface temperature. 
it means rise in the temperature of the ocean waters directly influence more number of cyclones to occur. Not only this, the El Nino patterns have also been found to change with more stronger events during hurricane season and attributed to the greenhouse effect. El Nino is the warm phase of the El Nino Southern Oscillations, ENSO. It is defined by warm ocean currents which develops in the central and east central equatorial Pacific Atlantic regions as shown in the picture due to warmer waters up and down welling at different locations and due to the winds. During the El Nino event, the warm tropical waters in the western Pacific Ocean shift towards the east along the equator towards the South American coast contrary to the warmer waters which stays near the Indonesian and Filipino coasts. These waters move off the shores of northwestern South America and thus called warm phase ENSO. El Nino cause above average precipitation and below average temperatures during the winter season. Answer to many questions why the winters are becoming more chillier when there is global warming. This not only influences the regions of the Pacific, namely Australia, North and South America, but also influences the coastal regions of Indian Ocean and Southeast Asia in the form of severe drought in India and Southern Africa. Not only this, it also has initiated new patterns of disease outbreak and spread, change in the patterns of the rainfall, fishing, harvest, and crop yields. The sea level rise causes coastal floods more frequent during the cyclone seasons and the saline water destroys the vegetation and forest very severely. As we can see in this picture, the flood has submerged most parts of the city. The saline water makes the soil unfit for recovery and new plantation besides eroding the topsoil and the nutrition. Global warming is bringing more avalanches to the Himalayas and ice-capped regions in the other part of the world. When a layer of snow becomes too heavy to hold with the layers underneath on a mountain slope, it collapses and slides downhill, which creates an avalanche. These are natural phenomena and can be created by the earthquakes when the tectonic plates underneath the mountains move. Other reasons are strong winds, rains, and heavy snowfalls. In the recent past decades, over-tourism and mountain hikes has aggravated the causes of avalanches. Additionally, snowmobiles, skiers, mountain campings like human activities are responsible sometimes. Climate change is making most of the glaciers on the earth unstable because of temperature fluctuations, increased rains and snowfalls, which renders the ice layers to hold the overlaying wet packed layers together and tend to collapse. Himalayas are the tallest mountain range in the world and often designated as third pole for the reason that the high altitude mountains alongside Tibetan Plateau and the Hindu Kush mountains are natural resting place to the largest permanent ice masses outside the Arctic or the Antarctica. Now the rise in the global average temperatures, the high elevations are warming faster than the other regions of the earth. Mountains are warming twice as faster as the global average causing frequent avalanches. Here in the map on the left side shows a region on the western part of the Himalayas and potential avalanche slopes. 
The graphical representation on the right hand side shows that the avalanches are almost down to zero during the years 1900 to 1970 and sudden upsurge in the occurrence after 1980s and onwards and becoming more frequent after the year 2000. In this world map is shown the snow-capped mountains and the regions vulnerable to the avalanches. The next in the list of adverse effects of global warming is the detrimental effect on blue carbon. What exactly on the earth is blue carbon? The blue carbon is the carbon dioxide removed from the atmosphere by the marine and coastal ecosystems. Marine ecosystem storing carbon dioxide include corals and coral reefs. The coastal ecosystem store another half of the blue carbon dioxide and bury beneath the ocean floor. The main types of coastal ecosystems are mangroves, seagrasses, tidal marshes, and marshlands, and macroalgae. The blue carbon ecosystems are 10 times more efficient to store carbon than the terrestrial forest ecosystems. Mangroves are the only species of tree on this earth that can tolerate salt water. There are 50 to 110 species of mangrove found on this earth which grow 2 to 10 meters in height and are found in the coastal regions. The unique structure of the tree with roots growing upward the ground construct a unique ecosystem in the coastal regions. The roots have pores called nematophores for respiration. The submerged roots naturally construct millions of safe housing sites for thousands of fish species ranging from 1 inch to 10 foot sharks. Mangroves are spread over 118 coastal regions across the tropical and subtropical countries spanning 137,000 square kilometers. Indonesia is the home of largest mangrove reservoirs on this earth with a cover area of 23,000 square kilometers along its island coastal regions. Another blue carbon ecosystem is the sea grasses, which are flowering plants growing in the marine environments. There are about 60 species of marine sea grasses fully adapted to thrive in the ocean environments. The sea grasses are considered as ecosystem engineers at micro level. Their extensive networks of tiny roots and rhizomes hold the shoreline sand from being washed away with the tides and help preserving the coastlines. In addition, it builds safe home and breeding ground for a number of ocean creatures, especially slow-moving organisms such as crustaceans and echinoids. Sea grasses photosynthesize to release oxygen to its surrounding microenvironment which in turn oxygenates the sediments and enhances the water quality. Furthermore, it stabilizes the heavy metals, pollutants and excess nutrients to prevent algal blooms to proliferate. The algal blooms and its severe consequences we have already seen in the previous part of this lecture. Here in the picture, we can see the sea grasses ecosystems built by turtle grass and thalassia. Alismatides are a kind of monocot sea grasses. It includes about 4500 species adapted to both aquatic and marine environments. The three prominent alismatides shown here are Otelia, Alisma, and snake lily. Macroalgae are widespread along every part of the marine ecosystem, also popularly known as seaweeds. 
It refers to the macroscopic multicellular marine algae and play a vital role in capturing carbon and producing up to 90% of the earth's oxygen. Seaweeds provide nutrients for the ocean ecosystem and fisheries. These are also commercially grown in large oceanic farms for food. Seaweed act excellent in the removal of excess nutrients by consuming it and prevent algal blooms to grow and create dead germs. China could remove its entire phosphorus effluent by increasing seaweed production by 150% and prevent creation of dead zones along with producing food for its population. The seaweed are also harvested to produce biogas. By decomposition, it produces 60% of methane and 40% of carbon dioxide in an anaerobic digester. Methane is used as biogas and carbon dioxide is stored for producing dry ice for packing perishable food and pharmaceutical products. Here in this picture we can see some examples of seaweeds namely Escophyllum, Fucus serratus, Dead Man's Fingers, Kelp, etc. Salt marshes or coastal salt marsh grows in the brackish waters in the coastal areas are regularly flooded by tidal waters. These are well adapted for coastal ecosystem and are high salt tolerant. These efficiently trap and bind the sediments and protect the coastal lines. In the recent past, these marshlands have been heavily encroached by humans for agriculture, urban development, salt production, etc. The rise in the global temperature and the sea level has affected adversely as disappearing marshlands fails to protect the coastal lines and erosion of the coastal soils during frequently occurring cyclones and storms. Here in this picture we can see the two different forms of marshlands. One is tidal salt marsh at Elnore in Chichester, England and another is an estuarine salt marsh along the Heathcote River, Christchurch, New Zealand. Mangroves have thick, strong, impenetrable roots which protect the shorelines from being washed away during the tidal washings and storms which could easily eat away the sandy land otherwise. This feature of the mangroves make it vital for the marine and estuarine ecosystems to survive and responsible for the protection of the coastal biodiversity. Mangroves also protect the corals and the coral reefs by impeding the strong tidal currents and the ocean storms. Here in this map is shown the presence and spread of mangrove forests at different coastal regions on this earth. The Asian shoreline constitutes more than half of the entire mangrove forest covers on this earth. The map on the top shows the mangrove cover in black color and in the bottom map the orange lines show Indonesia's mangrove area which constitute 23% of the world's forest cover. The delta regions of the coastal areas of India and Bangladesh is the home of the world's largest contiguous mangrove forest. Second picture is showing above and below water surface of a forest region. Mangroves survive the hostile salty environment by waxy secretion on the surface of its leaves and not letting the salt from the saline waters to damage it.
Like other incidences, the mangrove forest destruction occur both ways, namely because of climate change, rise of the ocean levels and anthropogenic activities as well. The anthropogenic activities are the human activities which include deforestation and claiming the land for agriculture and hunting the marine animals for food. The major anthropogenic activities which have been destructing the mangrove forest is deforestation for growing food crops such as rice and palm and growing prawn farms. Indonesia has lost almost 40% of its mangrove forest to the palm oil economy, aquaculture and pollution. Similarly, the Sundarban mangrove forest in India and Bangladesh is also threatened by the overpopulation and land encroachment. The condition is further worsening by increasing sea levels and frequent cyclones which has eroded huge land masses of the delta region and saline waters have nearly damaged the crop fields. Urbanization near and around the mangrove forests have further aggravated the destruction of the fragile ecosystem and shrinkage of the forest area covers. To rebuild the damaged forests, initiatives have been extended for replantation of the forests to save the coastal lines from eroding away. This process is being initiated and adopted in almost all coastal areas across the world under forest conservation programs. Here is a picture we can see a young mangrove plant at the shore and the second picture is the germination of the mangrove seeds directly from its roots. In the third picture, the young mangrove plantation in Philippines and in fourth, a young mangrove plantation in the Indus Delta. The endangered island nations in the Pacific have also found it the only way to save their homes from being swallowed away by the rising sea levels and taking on plantation of mangrove forests to save the eroding shores and shrinking of the land area. Here we conclude the third part and now we shall proceed towards the part 4 of this lecture.